So on the afternoon of Wednesday, August 17th, we're going to find out from the Senior Committee for the Pro Football Hall of Fame who are the three candidates that will move on in the process to get one step closer to joining the Pro Football Hall of Fame as part of the class of 2023. And I've done a couple of videos on this topic already, and uh, here is another one. And the videos I've done have been talking about somebody who I absolutely believe is not only worthy of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but should be in now, especially if the standard is what the standard should be, which is the best, most deserving candidates based off of their on-the-field career resume. That is Sterling Sharp, period. But then I've also done a video talking about how I look at somebody and I don't view them as a Hall of Famer. Their resume really does not support being a Hall of Famer. And the fact they've even advanced to this point is a reflection of the process going wrong and focusing on the wrong considerations. And that, of course, is Ken Riley. But now we're at a place where it's basically nut cutting time. The committee of 12 is going to meet and discuss the 12 candidates. And out of that, they're going to come up with three. And admittedly, right now, I don't know how this is going to land. This is kind of a new deal. They've expanded the number of seniors. You've got new members of this committee. I don't know how this is going to work. They could really, really get this right. Or you could see me doing rants on Twitter and rants on here later this week about how dumb they handled this process and how poorly this was handled and how they just flat out got this wrong. You know, because it's really hard for me to get a vibe on this process right now of where we're going to end up. Like my initial reaction or my initial thought, I keep coming back to like one of potentially two different combinations of who those three are going to be. Um, one combination is some type of like Randy Gratishar, Joe Klecko, and Ken Riley, which to me for two of those three would be really dumb. And it certainly isn't Gratishar. There's going to be another combination where it's something like it's Gratishar... It's maybe Kuchenberg, and then you get somebody like Klecko, and I'm like, well, that's a little better, especially with Kuchenberg being involved, but still, the process, to me, not working right. But the way I look at this year's class of seniors, like, first and foremost, I didn't even think he got anywhere close to what would be the 25 best seniors. Like, And that's sometimes going to be a difference of opinion, what have you, but if you point to actually, like, tangible resumes, they did not come up with the 25 best semifinals. They just didn't. And then, of course, when we got to the list of 12 finalists, at least we got rid of some of the names that didn't belong, like the Jim Marshalls of the world, uh, the Claytons and the Morgans, the Clay Matthews, like those guys don't belong. So, yes, it's a bit of gatekeeping. Well, it's all gatekeeping. Like you can't put everybody in the Hall of Fame. If you do, then it's not a Hall of Fame worth taking seriously anymore. But I really look at this year's class of 12 seniors in five tiers from bottom to top. Tier five is the bottom, and this is you can't be serious, as in there is no way in hell this guy belongs in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And certainly Bengals fans will hate me for this, but it doesn't matter. Sometimes the truth hurts. I know Bengals fans feel that Ken Riley belongs in the Hall of Fame, but they know darn good and well that this is for the wrong reasons. They're saying it because after the however many years of their club's history, going back 56 years or whatever the hell it is, they have one Hall of Famer, and that's Anthony Munoz, and they should have more. I absolutely agree with the assessment that they should have more than one Hall of Famer. I absolutely disagree with their approach that they have been artificially inflating Ken Riley's legacy to be better than it actually was. Like, to me, when you talk about the Hall of Fame, especially when you talk about the senior committee guys, part of the reason most of these guys are here is because their cases are much more nuanced. And to me, if you're just saying, well, with Ken Riley, he belongs because of the 65 INTs, that's absolutely no nuance. That's not how the process should work. Because as I talked about in my video about Ken Riley, he wasn't even the best corner on his team. That was Lamar Parrish. And you say, well, Jeff, that's just your personal opinion. No, it's the opinion of the peers of the time. The players, the coaches, the scouting services that teams use, they all pointed to Lamar Parrish being the vastly superior corner. My opinion is aligned with them. I'll take their word for it over a bunch of Bengals fans who are focused on, well, Ken Riley played his entire 15-year career, career in Cincy. He's in the ring of honor for the team. He's a guy that was great in the community. These are all wonderful things, but that doesn't make you a Hall of Famer. Ken Riley 
even getting to this point to me is ridiculous. And if he ends up being one of the three, it is absolutely a farce and a joke and it needs to be called out as such. Then we get to tier four. And these are the guys I could say, eh, maybe someday, but I certainly don't have great passion around them. But I really think there are better players available. And I also think the process doesn't work well if they get inducted this uh, for 2023. And that's Joe Klecko and Everson Walls. Like, I'm still scratching my head a little bit how Everson Walls gets through to the final 12 over somebody like Lester Hayes. And the only thing I can point to is that somebody like Gary Myers, who is on this senior committee, who clearly has a passion for getting the New York guys in, got both of these guys through to the final 12. Walls was a good player, don't get me wrong, but there are better defensive backs that I could point to. And I could say, they deserve representation here. Talk about Lester Hayes, this was a guy that actually was on an all-decade team that was a defensive player of the year. Everson Walls doesn't have that. You can say, well, he led the league in interceptions like three times. Okay, so what? That's nice. I'm not totally dismissing it offhand, but I look at a guy like Walls and I say, what's so special about him that he deserves to be in this spot? Same thing with Klecko. Yes, he was all pro at a couple of different positions, but you could also point to that kind of gangrene defensive line of the Jets in the early mid-80s. And you say for a number of years there, you question who was the most impactful or best defensive lineman on that team. Was it Klecko or was it Gastineau? Gastineau will never sniff this part of the process, but yet Klecko somehow has gotten to the final 12. I'm not saying absolute no to Klecko, but goddamn son, he is not one of the top three this go-round, period. Then I get to tier three, where you have like guys that are good cases, but not this year. Cecil Isbell is a bit of an outlier in the fact that he only played quarterback for five years back in the day. Like if you want to say, well, who the hell was Cecil Isbell? He was a quarterback for the Packers. When you hear about the name of Don Hudson, who was the guy that threw him a lot of those touchdown passes, it was Isbell. But he only played five seasons. He was clearly elite during his time, but a very short window. You know, even the fact that I'm putting him in this tier is more of a reflection of the fact of one of my real problems with the senior committee Two problems is one, if you play before the 1960s, it was largely <laughs> to you, and they also largely excluded the AFL. Now, obviously, Isbell doesn't check the box in the AFL piece, but he does check the box in the pre-1960 piece. Now, if I was going to choose a Packer from that time, you know, my friend Vinny would call out uh, Lavi Dilweg, and I would be inclined to agree with him that that would be a more worthy one, especially with the longer resume, the all-decade team, and so forth. Uh, I wouldn't be upset with Isbell making it this year. I doubt he would, but it's possible. There's a reason he made it to the final 12, but he wouldn't be one of the best three. Same thing with Nobis. Like, I'd be really curious to see somebody comparing Nobis to, like, a Maxi Bond or a Gratishar or a Chuck Howley. You know, Nobis obviously was the first great, like, Atlanta Falcons star, and you could say, well, the Falcons are underrepresented in the Hall of Fame, and that is probably true. But just because teams and organizations may be underrepresented in the Hall of Fame doesn't mean we should artificially inflate the cases of players just to solve for that problem. It should happen naturally in the right way in the process of these guys advance because they are the best candidates. Nobis is not the best candidate. He's not. He's not better than Bond, and he's certainly not better than Gratishar and Howley. You know, what is it the, the, with the committee if they put him into the final three? Would they say to themselves, like, hey, we really like the fact that he made fewer all-pro teams. He had fewer interceptions than guys like Gratishar and Howley. He had fewer sacks. He had fewer fumble recoveries. Like, that's so impressive. Like, yeah, maybe someday he belongs, but not on this list, especially compared to these other linebackers. Then you get to the Tier 2, which the Tier 2 to me is fantastic if they got in. Would not be my personal choices for this year, however... If any or all of them comprised of what ended up being this Hall of Fame class, I would still be pretty excited about it. And I will point to this committee doing some good things. That's Ken Anderson, Bob Kuchenberg, Eddie Medor, and Maxie Bond. Think about Maxie Bond. Played 11 prime seasons, if you will, in the NFL. 11 of them. And in that time, he was a pro bowler in nine of them. And you say, well, that's a popularity contest. Not exactly. Back then, it was players and coaches that voted on it. So you could still say maybe there's a bit of an element of popularity contest, but in no way is comparable to the Pro Bowl of now. Basically, what the peers and contemporaries of the time said about Maxi Bond during the 60s, if you think about this, is almost 90% of the time he was the absolute elite of his position. And you might say, well, there was less competition because of the AFL, blah, 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 whatever. Point being is he had to deal with what he dealt with at the time, and he was damn elite. Like it's a crock that him and some of the other linebackers on this list have even gotten to this point. So if he made it, even if it came at the expense of a Gratishar or Howley, I would understand and I'd be supportive of that. 
Would be my personal choice this go round, but I understand it. Eddie Midor, like I'm sorry, I can't look at Midor's resume and look at Riley's and say Riley's is better or Walls is better. I think that's ridiculous. You know, like Midor played both corner and safety at a high level for those Rams teams again in the '60s. You know, again, these are the guys that you should be looking at, and you're saying this is what the senior committee is supposed to do. They're supposed to help get some of these guys in. You look at Kuchenberg, he was like an eight-time finalist. It's a shame he passed away a couple of years ago, so he wouldn't be here to accept the honor. You know, if, if he was the offensive guy to make it from this group, I have no complaints whatsoever. Again, would be more of my choice in 2024, but if, he, if it happened a year earlier, so be it. Same thing with Ken Anderson. Like, I could make a strong case for Ken Anderson. Like, statistically, for his contemporaries, you know, you might hear some talk about, like, well, he had a stretch of time in his career where the stats weren't the best, but when you look at the entirety of the body of work, like... His numbers are better than Stabler's. His numbers are better than Bradshaw's and even Staubach's. And you could say for Anderson, well, what the hell would happen if he had guys like Drew Pearson and Tony Hill to throw to and he had Tony Dorsett for a stretch of his career, even if it was a few years to hand off to? What happens if he had Stallworth and Swan to throw to and he had Frank O'Harris and Rocky Blyer in the damn backfield? Like Isaac Curtis was nice, but he's certainly not some of those other guys that I named. I have any of those guys in that tier two, Anderson, Kuchenberg, Midor, Vaughn, if any of them made it, no real complaints. But to me, there's a clear-cut top three this year. I've already talked plenty about Sterling Sharp. I even did a dedicated video about it. He was basically, for those of you that didn't get a chance to watch him, he was Megatron Calvin Johnson with two fewer seasons, and I would argue actually a bit better for the seven seasons that he played. Like if Shannon, or excuse me, if Sterling Sharp had played another three to four seasons in the league, that would have taken him through like maybe ninety-five to ninety-eight. He would have at least gotten a Super Bowl ring, at least one with the Packers in the ninety-six season. Could have even been more if he was there. His numbers would be even greater. I mean, this is a guy that twice, once finished in the top five in MVP voting in the league, another time eighth. When you think about all of the wide receivers inducted into the Hall of Fame in like since two thousand ten. When you think about leading in those receiving triple crown categories of either receiving yards, receiving touchdowns, receptions, Jerry Rice is the GOAT. He leads the way with 14. The next on that list is not Randy Moss. It's not Terrell Owens. It is Sterling Sharp, which is an instance of the numbers and statistics backing up what our eyeballs told us when we saw him play for seven years, that he was the second best wide receiver in the game. And the only reason he was second best was because he played at the same time as the GOAT. And what would have happened if he had Joe Montana to and Steve Young to throw to him for his entire career? He didn't have a couple of years of Mikowski and then young Brett Favre. I have already made a strong case for Sterling Sharp. I'm just reinforcing it here. But the other two guys I want to talk about, Randy Gratishar. This would be my second choice. Now he, this should be his year. It needs to be his year. He only played 10 seasons, which is something that hurt him. But if you think about it, like Gratishar spent like 80% of his career, even as a Pro Bowler or an All-Pro. He was a seven-time Pro Bowler, two-time first-team All-Pro, three-time All-Pro second team. Like half of his career, he was deemed All-Pro. And you could say, even say, well, that's media stuff and blah, blah, blah. At some point in time, it has to be a reflection of something. He was the anchor of that Orange Crush defense that was really good in the 70s, was a key part of them getting to Super Bowl twelve. He can't help the fact that Craig Morton sucked dick in the Super Bowl. He can't help that. He was a 1978 Defensive Player of the Year in the entire NFL. Like, you look at Randy Gratishar and you go back and look at his resume, the only reason he's not in the Hall of Fame now is because of a slightly shorter career and the fact of his, some of his contemporaries that made the All-Decade team in the 1970s were Dick Buckkiss and Jack Lambert. And even then, I could potentially make a case for Gratishar being on the freaking first team all decade for the 70s over Butkus because Butkus only played from 70 to 73 and 73 he only made it through part of a season he was washed by then you're really only going off of three seasons Gratishar had more Gratishar absolutely belongs and should have been in by now and the fact that he hasn't been has held back the conversation on other Broncos that are absolutely worthy most notably I think of guys like Carl Mecklenburg and Lewis Wright especially Mecklenburg like, I'm sorry, but if you put Mecklenburg in New York and either one of those New York teams and he puts up the same numbers and the same achievements on the resume that he did, you wouldn't even be talking about a Joe freaking Klecko. Give me a break. And then I come to Chuck Howley. I'm going to hone in just on his prime years in Dallas. 
forgetting the fact that the Bears let him go after a little bit when they he actually started his career in Chicago. But at the time, like the Bears had Larry Morris and Joe Fortunato on the outside and Bill George at the middle, like that's one of the great linebacking cores in NFL history. But you look at Howling his thirteen years in Dallas. He was a six time Pro Bowler, five time first team all pro. Like how he didn't make the all decade team, but it got squirrely where guys like Dave frickin' Robinson did, I'll never understand. That's more of a reflection of rewarding guys for being along for the ride on championship teams and dynasties and overrepresenting those teams and underrepresenting truly great players from also really damn good teams. Those Cowboys teams of the mid late sixties were really damn good. There's a reason why they made it to Super Bowl V and Super Bowl VI in back-to-back years because it was a manifestation of what Landry had built and the talent that they had in place. But you look at that Cowboys team, like it took Mel Renfro forever to get in the Hall of Fame. It took Bob Hayes forever to get in the Hall of Fame. It's taken Chuck Howley even longer. And I'm sorry, but if you go back and watch, not only is Chuck Howley a Super Bowl MVP. He's the only Super Bowl MVP on a losing team in history. He's also the Super Bowl MVP with the most Pro Bowl and all pro appearances that is retired, that isn't in the Hall of Fame. And when you go back and actually watch Super Bowl V and Super Bowl VI, you can make the argument he had a case to be the Super Bowl MVP and Super Bowl VI as well when the Cowboys beat the Dolphins. What was it, 24-3? And this was when he was in his mid-30s. Like when you watch Chuck Howley in his mid-30s, he was tremendous. He was flying all over the place. His ball skills, his abilities as a run stuffer, his abilities as a pass defender, his ball skills, his instincts, his feel for the game, his birth, his burst, his athleticism. I promise you, you go back and watch Super Bowl V and Super Bowl VI, they jump out at you. So on the biggest stage, this guy put up some big time games. And it's almost like the fact that he wasn't on the all decade team, even though I certainly could argue that he should have been, especially over guys that actually did make it like the Larry Morris's um, of the world and the freaking Dave Robinson's of the world. Like Chuck Howley should have been there. Maybe even Maxie Bond should have been there too, for that matter. But this is a guy, you know, 24 career interceptions, 18 fumble recoveries, 26 sacks. You know, like when you look at a linebacker and the role that he played, like Howley absolutely belongs. And the fact that he has had to wait so long has held back somebody else, maybe like a Leroy Jordan from that team that also belongs too. But you got to be careful, like you got to pick and choose your spot. But when you look at Chuck Howley and you look at Gratishar, these two linebackers have waited way too damn long. It is their time. Their time is now. How much longer do they have to wait? Is their case magically going to get any better? And I'm sorry, but if you're going to sit there and point to me and say, well, let's say Klecko and Ken Riley did make it this year, I would laugh at your face if you tried to make a serious case for me saying that Joe Klecko was a better NFL player than Randy Gradishar. That's crap. Or that he was a better NFL player than Chuck Howley. That's crap. That's not a slight on Joe Klecko. That's a slight towards poorly informed fans and fan bases having fan loyalties looking at, the, as opposed to looking at the bigger picture. Same thing I would say about Ken Riley. Like if you tell me his case is more worthy than Randy Gratishar or Chuck Howley or that he needs to go in first, I'm going to laugh in your face. Because I should. Because that's ridiculous. Just because I have my three that I would choose doesn't mean that's the only combination that this senior committee needs to come up with for it to be a really good class. There are some, as I referenced here, there are some really, really good names. And especially if you look at the three that I put forth as kind of the tier one and then the other four for tier two. Like if three of them came out of that group of seven, man, I'm going to praise this class. It doesn't have to always align with my thinking, my opinions and my thoughts for it to be really well done. Now, I do look at these three that I name and say there is the most clear differentiation to them compared to anybody else on this list. However, for Anderson, Kuchenberg, Midor, Vaughn, they have really, really strong cases that could potentially carry a lot of weight. When you start getting lower down in the tiers, if they start, like if you tell me a Klecko means that Howley doesn't get into the Hall of Fame, I call BS. If a Riley gets in means that a Sterling Sharp doesn't get in, I absolutely call BS. Sterling Sharp was the unquestioned second best wide receiver in the league in his era. 
Ken Riley was only the second best corner on his team in his era for crying out loud. So anyways, here's hoping that the senior committee gets it right. Some really good candidates. And then you have some other ones that don't belong in the mix this year. I'm anxious to see how this is all going to play out.